Welcome back. Summer is just arriving here and it's time to assess our gardens. We've taken the test gardens through spring and they're really doing great. And it really hasn't taken all that much work. And that's because we prepared the soil and selected the right plants for the growing conditions. But when the seasons change, it's time to replace our cool season plants with more heat tolerant vegetable and flower varieties. We also want long lasting blooms from our annuals and perennials. So this season we'll cover garden maintenance throughout the season, as well as managing insects and disease. Then we'll visit our small space garden to find out how we solve some of those design challenges. But first, let's replace a few of those cool season vegetables. As you can see in just a few short months, our gardens really filled in. Plus our homeowners have enjoyed the harvest and it's been fun for them to pick and use directly. Now this row of radishes is starting to set flower and seed. So the flavor is going to be a little more bitter. So we're going to make one final harvest, then the rest goes in the compost. Let's see what we've got here. These are French breakfast radishes, so they're long and good for slicing. And as the heat builds in the, the atmosphere, it's really going to build the heat in the radish. We also have our onions and we're using these for drying. So they've got pretty good spacing, though we'll pull this one and use this as a nice spring onion and use it for a salad. And then we'll give more room for the rest to grow and reach good full size. Now you may be looking at our cauliflower and broccoli and wondering what happened. The cabbage worms have been busy. They eat holes in the leaves. The adults are moths, lay their eggs. The eggs hatch little green worms crawling around. Won't hurt you if you eat them, but it's maybe a little bit of unwanted protein. Now I like to use eco-friendly products. And one of my favorite is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria that only kills true caterpillars, but it won't hurt the beneficial insects. Mix it up with water. There are also powder forms available and spray on the plant. The caterpillars will stop eating immediately and eventually turn to mush in a couple of days. But you could harvest your cauliflower, broccoli, and eat it after rinsing just to change out the flavor a bit. Now you may notice the cauliflower wasn't covered. We blanch our cauliflower, fold the leaves over top to keep the sunlight out to keep it nice and white. But the damage from those cabbage worms really eliminated those leaves. Here you can see that it's starting to fold over. If we control the cabbage worms, we should be fine. Our homeowner also harvested one head of broccoli. She's leaving the plant. So if that environment stays cool this summer, she'll get some little sprouts on the side. If the flavor's not so good, time to compost it and replace it with a late planting for fall harvest. Our peppers are starting to come on. They love the warm weather. So we're gonna do some harvesting a bit later on those. I love growing Brussels sprouts. I think I'm one of the few people that likes to eat them. But one of the reasons I like to is I like to show people where Brussels sprouts form. They're actually buds in the leaf axle that we're gonna be harvesting probably on our next visit to this garden to enjoy grilled or you know steamed, mm, tasty and good for you. Our peas are just finishing up for the season. We grew edible potted peas. So we really like to pick those when they're flat like this. The pot is edible, the seeds are small, they're very tasty. If you let them get too big, even edible potted peas are still pretty tasty, but you may wanna pop them open if they're getting a little stringy, eat the seeds separately. But when you start seeing the bulges, then it's time to eat the seeds and leave the pods in the compost bin. We're gonna pull these out because the weather's getting hot, they're starting to fade, no flowers left, so we'll make our last harvest and replace them with some beans. Our tomatoes have really taken off. In fact, we even have some green tomatoes. Covering our plants early in the season with those floating row covers, season extending fabrics has really paid off. We'll have a much earlier harvest. Now, as you can notice, those on the ladder and the stake need a little more pruning. We have to keep after that so that they'll fit. That's why I like the towered version because it's a lot less work for me. I push those branches in as needed and that's all I need to do. I'll have a little bit later harvest, but more tomatoes to enjoy. Now we put some short season crops, some greens in between our tomatoes, knowing that as our tomatoes grew, those greens would start to flower 
get a little bitter, and they'd be ready to clear out, compost, or eat whatever's still good. So let's take those out. We'll take a taste. If they're still good, we'll use them. If not, we'll put them in the compost pile. Just a different way of recycling our plants. As you can see, the cabbage worms have also hit this garden bed. The good news is they haven't done much damage to the main head, one of the advantages of our early crop of cabbage. Now this head's nice and solid and ready to harvest. And one of the things I often hear from gardeners, one head of cabbage, one plant, what a waste of space. I can help you increase your harvest. Basically take a good sharp knife when that head is full size, and we can use this. Then look for all those little buds right around the stem. Those will grow into smaller heads of cabbage. You'll end up with four to five small heads, one larger head of cabbage. You can make a lot of slaw and kraut from that. Now our eggplants are looking a little shabby. The flea beetles did a lot of damage early in the season. I swear they wait by the edge of the garden just to start feeding. So you'll notice the damage. Most transplants can tolerate it but they're looking a little peaked, which is a good reminder, it's time to give our garden a nutrient boost. We packed in the plants here, and so they really are using a lot of moisture and nutrients. I like to use a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. And the reason being is it won't promote excessive leaf and stem growth at the expense of flowers and fruit. Now, most of them will work their way through the mulch, but you can also lightly cultivate to get that fertilizer in contact with the soil. So check the label and make sure you follow directions. Our herbs are looking great and ready to do some harvesting. I know our homeowners have been picking and using these all along. When you're harvesting herbs for drying, you wanna pick them right before, just as they're starting to bloom, you'll get the most intense flavor, more oils. When you use them for cooking, harvest them as you need. I like to cut right above a set of healthy leaves. And I always use garden scissors for a cleaner cut. The reason being, the plant you left behind will look good. It'll branch out, keep producing more leaves and stems for a bigger harvest. So keep harvesting as needed and enjoy. We're gonna check out the progress of our perennial garden next. Summer's a great time to reassess our garden and see what we need to do to keep our plants healthy and looking their best. Now, when we mix edibles with our ornamentals, we need to harvest not only for productivity, but also keeping the plants looking good. We've got Swiss chard here and harvesting the outer leaves when they're eight to 10 inches long, not only ensures good flavor, but keeps the plants producing throughout the season. Now I love to take a bucket of water out to the garden when I'm harvesting greens. It keeps them nice and crisp and fresh until I'm ready to use them. We've also got some curly parsley as our edge and for edibility, but notice someone else has been chewing on our parsley. And if you take a close look, you'll see the caterpillar of a swallowtail butterfly. It will soon convert into a beautiful butterfly. And we don't need to worry about the health and vigor of our parsley. It'll quickly come back and we'll have beautiful butterflies and parsley to use in our meals. Now let's take a walk through our perennial garden and see what else needs to be done. Fertilization is on the list of many gardeners' summer chores, but if you properly prepare the soil and use a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer when establishing a perennial garden like we did here, you're done for the season. Don't be fertilizer happy like so many people. You know, proper soil prep, good healthy plants, let them be your guide to fertilization. Now we use cone flowers in this garden, Echinacea, right at the front. You may be surprised, but these dwarf cultivars, powwow berry, really lead your eye right into the garden and to the taller plants behind. Good color, compact growth. Much different than those that we used in our small space test site. We went for a taller cultivar, different colors, perfect solution for a narrow bed with a tall backdrop. Not only did we consider plant size when planning our garden, but also texture. The bold flowers, the cone flower, play nicely off the fine foliage of the bronze fennel. And that leads your eye right to the Japanese maple, a wonderful combination to guide you through the garden. Now harvest the bronze fennel as you need it for cooking, but always check for insects. Caterpillars love the foliage, so do beneficial insects. Leave them in the garden, not on the dinner plate. Then, as the season progresses, our caryatris is gonna come into bloom and add some beautiful blue flowers. You can see the flower buds just starting to swell. 
Many perennials benefit from deadheading, but others don't. It's more cosmetic than to encourage more bloom. In the case of the penstemon, you can see it's just finishing up its bloom, but we're leaving the seed heads because they're very decorative as well. Now, penstemon can get floppy in rich soils or a little too much shade, so you may need to do staking as the plants get older. Or better yet, let the neighbors grow, fill in, and those neighboring plants will help give it the support you need. You may notice the space between our plants. They're doing great for a first year planting, and we wanted to leave plenty of room for them to gradually reach their mature size, especially the miscanthus, the ornamental grass in the back. We didn't want to have to dig and divide too soon, so we gave them plenty of room to grow. Our Walker's Low Catmint is doing great, and usually the first year, it always holds the center. But as the plants mature, sometimes mid-season, they'll flop over and they'll need a good haircut. Don't let the calendar, but rather your plant's growth, be your guide. And weeds, they're always a problem that needs to be managed. By keeping up with them, you'll reduce the problem over a long period of time. Hand digging is one of the most effective ways to control weeds eco-friendly, but you need to make sure you get the whole rhizome and root system, otherwise you end up with problems because you're just propagating more weeds. So for things like this mugwort or quackgrass that have an extensive rhizome system, I often use a little help from a total vegetation killer, something containing glyphosate. It'll kill any plant it touches, so you need to apply carefully. I use this little trick take a milk jug, soda bottle, or a pot with the bottom removed, cover my weed, protect my nearby plants, and spray. That way, it won't get on my plants. When it hits the soil, it's not absorbed by the roots. The good plants are safe. The weeds, not only the top, but the roots and rhizomes will die back as well. Now let's move to our small space test site to do some maintenance there. Extend your garden's bloom power with a little dead heading. Now some flowers, like impatience, are self-cleaning. They drop their old blossoms and produce new ones. No dead heading needed. But others, like snapdragons, need a helping hand. As you can see, this plant's kind of finishing up flowering and starting to set seed. By removing the faded flowers and the seed heads, we'll keep new blooms forming. We're going to cut that off right below the flower head and above a set of good healthy leaves. We'll just drop these into the garden because snapdragons are self-seeding and especially in warmer climates you'll get new plants. Now in some areas where the summers are hot your snapdragons even with deadheading will stall out and stop blooming just a bit but when the temperature's cool you'll get new flowers. Now if we take a step back we'll see these snapdragons need a little bit of a helping hand. They're starting to flop over, they're a little taller. We've got some stakes and our goal is to give them a little helping hand and support. Pop that stake in, put a few stems in and try to mask that support. We want it to look natural so the stakes don't detract from the plant but give it a upright growth and keep it out of the driveway. Now we've done our best to match the plants to the growing conditions and give them proper maintenance and care, but even so we often have insect and disease problems. Even though a plant, a healthy plant is your best defense, sometimes nature has other plans. So we're going to take a visit to our garden studio and learn new ways and eco-friendly ways to control insects and diseases. As you can see, I like to use eco-friendly methods of controlling pests in the garden. I follow what's called the plant health care system. It's an integrated, holistic method of managing pests in concert with the environment. Now, so far, we've discussed many of the steps involved in plant health care, matching the right plant to the growing conditions, providing proper care such as water, fertilizer, and weed removal. And weed removal is very important because these plants can harbor insects and diseases that can cause problems in our current and future growing seasons. Now, despite our best efforts, problems can occur. And when they do, we need to first identify the cause and decide if treatment is needed. Some problems are just an aesthetic issue, and it's something you and the plant can live with. Let's look at some of the more common symptoms and possible causes. Now at some point when gardening, you're going to encounter one of the most common problems I see, yellow, brown, and discolored leaves. The cause could be one or more of the following. 
too much or not enough water, too much or not enough fertilizer, environmental issues like pollution, root damage caused by construction and chemicals, or pests, both insects and diseases. Other symptoms that you may see when growing plants include holes in the leaves. Now these holes can be caused by insects that have chewing mouth parts like caterpillars and beetles or snails and slugs. It could also be disease spots that fall out. The tissue dies and drops out, kind of confusing you a little bit, thinking it might be an insect problem. And then of course there are leaf spots, lesions, and cankers. Cankers are sunken in discolored areas that occur on stems and branches and are usually caused by a disease. Now we can start narrowing down the possible causes by knowing the plant and its common pest problems. This will help you diagnose the cause. For example, Phlox has problems with powdery mildew, root rot, Phlox plant bug, and two spotted mites. Now knowing the plant's botanical and scientific name is also helpful for getting the correct diagnosis and developing a treatment plan. Let's go back to our Phlox example. It's garden phlox that we're looking at, called Phlox paniculata, scientifically. Now it's most susceptible to powdery mildew and less susceptible to the other pests that we mentioned that attack all types of phlox. Using the scientific name also ensures clear communication with experts or the resources you do your research in, such as university extension, garden publications, garden center staff, and other professionals. Now once the pest is identified, we need to decide if control is needed. And if so, is it a problem that's just aesthetic, like we mentioned before? Galls are a very common one. These lumps and bumps can appear on oaks and maples and many other plants. They're actually caused by aphids, adelgids, mites, psyllids, or other insects feeding on the leaves and stems of the plant. In response to that feeding, the plant forms these growths right over the insect. So if you were to go out and spray at that time, the tree or shrub is actually protecting that insect that attacked it. So control is not effective at that time and really not needed if your plant is healthy. Now some pests, like dog vomit fungus, it's a slime mold. It looks disgusting, but it only feeds on organic matter and mulch, so there's really no need to control it. But what you can do to avoid the problem is lightly rake the mulch to help it dry out. That avoids the formation of the slime mold. If it does appear, you can either wait for it to dry out naturally or scoop it up and toss it away. It won't hurt the plants. But other problems like aphids and mites, they suck plant juices and they may warrant control when the populations are high. If control is needed, let's look for and use some of the most eco-friendly options available. You may decide to wait and just tolerate some damage and let nature manage the problem. I have a great story about my daughter related to this. When she was little, we'd walk past a planting of goldenrod every day at the end of the day. And one time I saw it was full of aphids. Well, like every good gardener, I decided oh, I'll do a, deal with it tomorrow, and it soon became two weeks. Fortunately, the lady beetles moved in and cleaned out those aphids. It was the highlight of her gardening experience, and everybody that came to visit watched those ladybugs eat the aphids. So toads and birds and beneficial insects like ladybugs, praying mantid, and green lacewings will help control those pests. And you can also remove the problem by hand. Pluck it off the plant, drop it on the ground, and stomp it. A method that the kids at the Royal Botanic Garden in Hamilton, Ontario, showed me and have been using ever since. So pick off those insects or those damaged leaves and take care of them. Now let's take a look at some more eco-friendly solutions you might want to try. For some insects, like aphid and mites, you can use a strong blast of water to dislodge the insects. And you want to make sure it's nice and strong. Now what I do is often set them under the sprayer in my sink or for my big plants under the shower. This is especially helpful for plants that are indoors if you're worried about kids and pets or edibles like the basil. You can also use barriers and these physically prevent the insects from reaching the plant. One of my favorites is Reme. It's Harvest Guard, Frost Blanket, Floating Row Cover. And one of the good things about this is it also provides frost protection. But basically, 
You drape this over your plants, anchor it on the sides, and it prevents cabbage worms, bean beetles, and even rabbits from eating your plants. I have a great picture of covering my cabbages with the floating row cover and a rabbit sitting on top looking at the cabbage beneath, trying to figure out how to get in there and eat it. Traps also work very well. A bowl filled with soapy water, yellow, to help attract the insects, or white fly traps. These yellow sticky traps that you could make or purchase at the garden center have a sticky substance on top. So when the white fly go to attack your plants, they stick to the trap instead of sucking the plant juices out of your favorite house plant. There are also some natural products available. Insecticidal soap's been on the market for quite a while and it's been tested and it will kill many soft-bodied insects like plant bugs, aphids, and mites. And again, it's eco-friendly and safe for you and your pets. Nematodes are relatively new on the market. They've been around for quite a while, but there's a new formulation or a new type of nematode that will feed on fungus gnats that attack our house plants. The fungus gnats aren't harmful, but definitely annoying. The nematodes are a safe way to manage them. And mosquitoes, which can be annoying, we can take care of those in our water gardens using Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, a formula that's good at killing mosquito larvae. Pop these in your water garden and you'll take care of the problem. Keep in mind insects and disease build up over time when we grow the same plant in the same location for many years. We can reduce this by rotating out of family because you see family members like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants are susceptible to many of the same insects and diseases. Now farmers have been rotating their crops for centuries, but you can do it right in your own backyard. Edibles, for example, you could plant tomatoes one year. In that same spot next year, grow onions. Follow those with beans. In your flower bed, try petunias. Follow them the next year with geraniums, and those can be followed by marigolds. So we're switching out the plants to reduce the buildup of insects and diseases. Now working in concert with nature certainly will reap loads of benefits. It usually means less problems in the future but you may need to tolerate some damage in the short term, just like we did with the aphids waiting for the lady beetles to come in and feast upon them. Plus, when you work with nature, you won't create other problems when you kill the good guys by accident when you're trying to control the bad guys. So the end result, you save time and money and you're kind to the environment. Well, now that you're armed with some knowledge about how to maintain your garden, let's go back to the urban test site to see how we solve some of our more challenging design issues. Function, beauty, and accessibility are often hard to achieve, especially in small spaces. You may remember our hose right here by the front entrance. Not the prettiest thing, but we needed to keep it accessible for watering. So we found a solution. We've added a trellis to help block the view and we'll train this climbing hydrangea over on the wall and onto the trellis. It will mask the view of the hose and create a nice backdrop for this fountain. Now we picked wood because climbing hydrangeas use rootlets to attach to rough surfaces like brick and wood. We've also included an annual vine, the black-eyed Susan vine, that will twine up this trellis so we'll get quick cover this season while that climbing hydrangea slowly migrates over creating a beautiful backdrop. The fountain is an added focal point, a little noise to cover out the traffic and it really creates a nice focal point as the homeowner comes home and pulls up the driveway and into the garage. Now to the next side. On this side of the entrance to our townhouse, we had this tall blank brick wall. It was a nice backdrop for these flowers, but didn't provide the pizzazz we were looking for at this entrance way. And we also had a problem with erosion. The downspout emptied into the garden bed, washing away the soil. So we added some stones to protect the soil where the downspout enters the garden bed. Then we looked for a solution for this wall. We considered evergreens, but the homeowner really didn't think that was appropriate. We thought about artwork like a bottle tree, but it really didn't fit into our landscape design. So we looked for this black obelisk. It blended with the railings, tying this whole area together. And then we looked for a vine to cover it. Now we thought about an annual vine for quick cover, but we wanted a more permanent solution. So we looked for the honeysuckle vine, quick cover, plus it'll attract hummingbirds to the landscape. And the orange flowers echo the color of these cone flowers in front of it a wonderful, wonderful solution. 
Now I can't wait to take you back to the patio to surprise you with the solutions we came up with there. Our first challenge was to hide the utilities yet leave access. Now originally we were thinking a wonderful screen, maybe some old doors or an artistic divider or screen or maybe a screen with planters. But we decided to save our big budget for something spectacular and hold off until we find a nice screen. So in the short term, we found this beautiful potted fern, placed it on an affordable table. We've got a great solution for now and something we can move around and use elsewhere. Now let's look at our next spot. In this area, we had problems with the erosion, water rushing off the deck, the plants were washed away, containers didn't work. The homeowner put river rock here and that took care of the erosion problem protecting the soil, but we still had a blank spot. We're looking for the perfect piece of art, but in the meantime, we've got containers softening the fence. We used a fern to echo the fern in our first area we looked at, and we still had a blank wall. So we found this beautiful bird bath, but a little low. So we put a pot of soil, and we'll anchor it in that, and now the birds and the homeowner are happy. You may remember that beautiful tall grass that was right next to the entry of the garden. It was crowding out this climbing hydrangea, so we moved it out and shared it with a friend. We've replaced it with a much smaller grass, prairie drop seed. In fact, a dwarf version of the native. It'll give us year-round interest on a much smaller scale. But in the meantime, we've potted up divisions and transplants into beautiful containers to provide vertical interest, not only from the plants, but also from the containers. It's a great way to make your garden budget go further and add some interest in the short term. You may notice the mum. We've been pinching it back so we'll have beautiful blooms come fall. We've changed out our pansies to more heat tolerant annuals. We've got heliotrope and the purple flowers echo the foliage of our coral bells and the flowers of a stilby, carrying that purple throughout the garden. We've added white and lantana to brighten up this bed, especially helpful when the homeowner sits here at night, just brightens that night garden. We've added that golden moneywort ground cover, it's a perennial, and that chartreuse foliage makes all the other plants just pop. In our corner, we've got Simisifuga. It's a good shade tolerant plant. And it's getting a little bit of morning sun here and it's doing great. It'll have nice purpley foliage to pull this garden together and white flowers over top. The hot cone grass, really that bright chartreuse just brightens that area. Now you may notice we've used the same combination in our dark corner. The plants are doing okay, but much slower. Because of the low light, it's gonna take them a little longer to catch up. You may remember that our solution for this fountain was to use cannas, but we planted some lobelias and they're still looking good. So we're gonna leave them intact and keep our cannas growing in their pots until we're ready to switch them out. Now the reason the lobelia work in this wet area is we put them in tall, narrow containers. It elevates them so the flowers just look great spilling out underneath the fountain and any excess water collects in the bottom of the pot won't drown out the plants. And if we get a lot of rain or run the fountain a lot, the homeowner can dump that excess and reset the lobelia back into that container. You may also notice this wonderful papyrus, a great water plant, but also a good container plant growing in soil. We thought here in a pot, it really framed out that fountain and anchored it into the planting. Now we only used one. So if you like symmetry, it may be bothersome until you take a look. This asymmetrical design has this on one side and the clematis sweeping across the fence, balancing it out. Different form, different shape, but it works nicely. You may also notice that we switched out our spring annuals to our summer annuals, more heat tolerant plants. We have the beautiful heliotrope with the fragrance that the homeowner can enjoy in the evening. The vinca that take full sun to shade and hot dry conditions. In our lantana, the white pulls the white all the way around and helps attract the butterflies. Now you may remember the big grasses we took out that were on either side of the entryway here to the back patio. We replaced one of them with Shenandoah switchgrass. Now it's a little small, but eventually will get four feet tall, provide year round interest. Then we potted up some of the hosta divisions from the plants we divided out front. We potted them up, set them in the garden to provide a vertical accent. It's a great temporary solution until our Shenandoah switchgrass grows to full size. 
As you can see, we saved a large portion of our budget for this corner of the patio area. We invested in this beautiful arch so that we could help hide the air conditioner and the utilities, yet leave access for the meter people. And what we'll want to do is train vines over this archway to help make it anchored into the planting area. We've got the hyacinth bean vine here that will really cover this trellis by the end of the first growing season. It's an annual. The sweet autumn clematis will take a couple years to get established, but when it does, you'll have beautiful white blossoms covering the archway and providing wonderful fragrance for our homeowner to enjoy. Then we moved the bench over to further hide the air conditioner and added a couple of hanging baskets to draw your eye up and over the air conditioner. Though your problems may be different, the strategies for solution are the same. Next session, we'll be replanting for fall, adding bulbs for spring beauty, doing a bit of pruning, protecting our plants. session we'll explore ways to extend color into and through the fall season by planting and replanting plus we'll get a jump start on next year's garden and we'll look for ways to prepare your plants for winter whether it's installing a cool season garden or protecting your plants from harsh weather and we'll cover a few pointers on pruning soon you'll discover fall's a great time for planting trees shrubs and perennials why the soil's warm and the air's cool. Great for the plants and the gardener. It's also a good time to record what went well and what you plan to change in the future. So let's get started by replanting a bit of our vegetable garden. Our teepee trellis was covered this spring with edible potted peas. Once they faded, we filled the trellis with beans harvested just in time to give way to these huge Brussels sprouts. Now, I'm probably one of the few people that loves Brussels sprouts, and maybe you do too, but I thought you'd enjoy seeing how they grow. It's kind of an unusual plant. The sprouts develop all along the stem, maturing from the bottom up. Now, you notice we had a lot of damage on the leaves from cabbage worms, and I think that's what happened to the lower leaves, because we like to leave the leaves on the plant as long as possible. The more leaves, the more energy produced, the better your harvest. So, we've got a few that are just ready for picking here, and they snap off very easily. And the wonderful Brussels sprouts can be steamed or grilled and buttered, and they take a light frost. So if you plant a little later or an early frost steps in, it'll just improve the flavor. In front of them, we have a variety of peppers, both bell and hot peppers. Now peppers start out green, and as they mature, they turn a nice red. Now with sweet bell peppers, the flavor intensity improves and it gets sweeter as it reddens. So wait till they're fully formed, starting to red, you'll have a sweeter crop. Many varieties are being introduced that turn red sooner. For hot peppers, they start out green, turn red or yellow or orange, and the flavor improves. So we've still got a little bit of harvesting to do here to enjoy, but let's step over and see what's happening in the next bed. As you can see, our tomatoes did great. In fact, the homeowner had so many she was able to do a bit of canning. Now, a closer look at the plant may reveal a little bit of a disease problem called septoria leaf spot. And one of the things you may notice are these spots on the leaves. A common disease on tomatoes usually starts from the bottom and works its way up. The plant is fine, but by the end of the season, you'll have the ugliest looking tomato. One way to reduce problems with this is rotating your crops. So next spring, we'll plant our 